This recording is looking at the sample mock paper for the interim assessment for SFMA. So again, I'm assuming you read through the question on SAMBO PLC, and I'm going to work through each of the requirements then in order. So there's three specific requirements here. Prepare a report for Luke Flynn. First is the weighted average cost of capital. So coming from your Cap 1 Finance or Session uh, 2 in Strategic Finance at Cap 2. We then ask for, for a labour variance report, subdivide the overall labour variance into rate and efficiency. So again, that's your basic CAP1 level variances. But then recalculate the variances using the learning curve effect. So that's an impact of how the learning curve could impact on variances, which is session one in CAP2 uh, management accounting. And discuss the implications then of your findings, which is using part one and two. And finally, then they're looking at the approach to budgeting in SAMBO and discuss at least three alternative approaches. So you have overall 95 marks and prepare a report really for that is to keep it neat. And at the start of your answer, you put to Luke Flynn from a accountant, re uh, SAMBO PLC. And that will get your presentation marks as well as laying out your calculations neat in an appendix. You can put the appendix at the start if you wish, but there where your five marks are going for, so don't throw those away. So we're going to go straight then into the weighted average cost of capital. You're given information here in the funding paragraph, I assume you've read, and we have four sources of finance. Ordinary shares, preference shares, redeemable bonds, and a 10-year loan that they've just raised. So your first protocol is to set up the answer. So we'll do the two, Luke Flynn, from, we call it A Accountant, and then you're going to have re Sambo PLC. And the way I would set it up is your part A will be the final answer. So you just put in your weighted average cost table there, but I would cross reference then working one to working four for each of the sources of finance. So we'll start off then with the ordinary shares. We're told each ordinary share is trading at 150 x div. So in our working one, we have the x div price, which is the one you want is one euro fifty. Now we need to figure out firstly we have the market value because you have it one euro fifty and you know the number of shares there will be just be careful it's a hundred million. So it's eighty million share capital but each share is eighty cent. That means you need a hundred million shares to have eighty million of share capital. So the number of shares there will be one million. So that means the market value, which you need for your table for WAC, will be 1.5 million. Which is 1 million shares at 1 euro 50 each. So that's your starting point, and slot them in as you go. So we have the first one done, that's probably going to be a mark, is getting the market value of the ordinary share capital. So the thing for WAC is you approach it as an individual elements each, and only at the very end then will you bring them all together. Right, so we've been in thousands there, so I'll just be consistent. I'll put in 150,000 uh, there because I've dropped off the last three zeros. So you can do, you don't have to drop off the three zeros if you wish. Now to get the cost of equity, we've usually two approaches: either using Cap M when you're looking at betas and risk-free rates, or here we're told about dividends, and we're told what the dividend was this year and what the dividend was four years ago in 2012. So remember back one other way of getting the cost of equity. So if we go back to our cap one days with the cap one formulas, that's your cap M. We're not going to be using cap M here because we don't have risk free rates and we don't have betas. But we do have the dividend valuation model. So this is the one we're looking at. Dividend valuation model finding the cost of equity. So we're looking, it's just rearranging the normal dividend valuation model to solve for K. We have the dividend today. 0.2, we have the price 1.5, and to find the growth rate, we're going to have to use the historic growth rate. So if we go back to the question, we're told that the growth rate four years ago, or the dividend four years ago, was 12 cent. So div in 2014 was 0.12, and the div in 2018 was 0.2. So what you need to get here is the compound average growth rate. And how you do that is you put the 0.2 divided by 0.12 to the power of the number of periods of growth, which is 1 over 4. 
So you're saying it grew by a factor of 0.2 divided by 12 cent. So if you want to do that first, it grew by 66%. It's gone up by 1.66. And therefore, you're going to put that to the power of 1 over 4 to say, on average, what did it grow each year? Because that's over a four-year period. And you take off 1 to get the percentage. So the average dividend growth from 14 to 18 was 13.62%. So 13.62%. And now you have everything you need for that particular formula. You have the D0, which is 0.2. You have the price, which is 150. And you have the growth rate, which we're going to use as 13.6. So we'll come down here then and find the cost of equity for Sambo. is going to be using the formula we can see here. In brackets, 0.2 times 1.136. So I'm just rounding it to 1.136 divided by 150. And then you're adding on 1.136 as well. So just make sure you'll have these formulas. Remember, the SFMA interim assessment is open book, but you need to understand what each of the inputs is. And that will hopefully get you 28.7%. It's 28.75%. And that's your cost of equity. You don't adjust for tax because dividends are not tax deductible. So we 28.75% and I slot it in there. And that's a quarter now of our table done. We need to fill in all those eight boxes with a cost of capital and a market value for each. And only then will we worry about the overall um, calculation. So next one then is our preference shares, which is working too. So in that case, we're looking here, we're told the come div price was 575 and a full year dividend will be paid in two weeks time. So when it says come div, we need to make sure we make an adjustment for the accrued dividend. So you're told here the nominal value, the power value of the preference shares are five and there's six percent preference shares and there's 30 million of them in a book value. So our first step will be for working two is to get the X div price. You always need the X div price when you're dealing with a preference share. So com div price is 575 and the annual dividend is due to be paid soon. So the dividend per share here is 6% of 5 euro. So 5 times 6% is 30 cent. So the X div price will be 5.45. So it's important that you always work off X div because that's the price that you'll be able to raise these shares at in the future. You can't include any accrued dividends. Right, so you have your price now and you're told the preference shares are 6%. So how we get the cost of preference shares, so the K of P, which is cost of preference shares, is equal to the dividend, which is 30 cent, over the price. So it's a very straightforward one. We always assume preference shares are irredeemable. So it's just going to be the dividend in euros divided by the price in euros. And we always use the adjusted X div price. So the cost of preference shares there, a nice and straightforward one, is 5.5%. And you note you don't adjust for tax there either because preference dividends are not tax deductible. It's only debt you adjust for after tax. And to get the market value then, how you approach that is, you say it's worth 30 million. So I'll do 30,000 because I've dropped the last three zeros. However, that's at its book value. So you divide by five, each share is worth five, and you multiply by 5.45. So the market value there is 32,700 or 32.7 million. So the preference share there was a bit straightforward because it was irredeemable. You'll always get some short ones and some longer ones. So there we have 5.50% and we have 32.700 and that's half our table complete. So our next one then is the redeemable bond. Now remember, I'm just taking them in order. If I was in the exam and advising a student, I'd do the pro bank loan next because it's the easiest one. Redeemable loans are always the hardest. I'd always leave those till the end because even if it goes wrong then, you'll have a lot of your marks got already. So 
The redeemable bond here is trading at X interest price of 89. And the tax rate is 12.5%. So it's an 8% redeemable bond, the year 2025. So that means it is 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Seven years left to run before it's been redeemed. And when you're doing redeemable, so when you're dealing with the redeemable bond, you're always going to use the IRR approach. Because it's redeemable, it's a bit trickier. And you're going to lay out the cash flows. So your first step is lay out the cash flows that you would happen. So in year zero, you'd buy it for 89. In years one to seven, you would have cash flow of eight. Now where that cash flow is coming from, if you're wondering, it's coming from each bond is paying 8%. And we assume the power value is 100 if it's trading at 89. At the end of year seven, you get 100 back as well. So that's what we call the cash flows of the bond. That's always your first step. Now, remember interest on tax, interest on debt is tax deductible. So you have to get the cash flows. Then the second step is after tax. And the only thing you're adjusting here is the interest. The payment up front or the receipt at the end, there's no tax deductibility. They're just capital figures. But this eighth that you have a payment or receipt each year, you're going to multiply by one minus the tax rate. So the after tax cost of interest will be seven. So it's one taking off one eighth, which is 12 and a half percent. Now in some questions, they will have a positive figure here and two negatives here. That's entirely perfect. It doesn't matter as long as you have the opposite signs because you're going to come to the exact same IRR. My preference is to leave the negative figure first because that is the more natural way we've done the IRR formula for investing appraisal. So it'll work in similar approaches. The other thing to watch when you're doing an IRR is like this. This is a particular type of cash flow. Same cash flow for a fixed amount of years. That is an annuity. So therefore, when you're doing the present value, you're going to use your annuity tables. Doesn't make sense to try and do out seven years individually. You're going to waste a lot of time and you'll get indirectly penalized because you won't be able to finish the paper. So to do an IRR, we need one NPV that's negative and one NPV that's positive. So therefore, what we're going to do is I always tell students start around 10% and then you can wor worry about um whether you need to go higher or lower after that. So the discount factor at 10%, the discount factor for year zero will always be one. The present, the year seven cash flow is a normal cash flow as well. So if we go to our tables, we can go to our present value tables, 10% for seven years is 0.513. So we're saying the discount factor there is 0.513. And in the middle, you don't have to do them individually. You now go to your annuity tables and say, I have a seven year annuity and it's at 10%. So not these tables, the next one. 10% for seven years is 4868. So you multiply the annuity cash flow by 4868. And that will get your present value and then your NPV. So in WAC, you can actually be examined on NPV and IRR as well. So it's very easy for the examiner to bring them all in to a single question. So present value here is just minus 89 because it's the cash flow times one. Here it is seven times your annuity factor. So the value of all those cash flows for seven years is 34.076. And finally then in seven years, that 100 euro is actually its present value today is 51.3. So it's very straightforward using your tables and to work in. You can use your calculator, of course, if you wish, using the formula. Either one is fine. And that net present value is minus 3.624. So meaning we're negative there. So we need an alternative positive. And there's an inverse relationship. So if we have a negative NPV here, we want to increase the NPV. So we're going to lower the discount rate to say 5% NPV calc. So it's trial and error, but try and make sure you have one positive, one negative. And the discount factors at 5% will change. The year zero is the same. Any discount factor at year zero will always be one. The 
annuity factor for seven years at 5% is 5.786. See it here. And then the present value factor of a single cash flow in seven years' time. Go to the present value tables, 5% for seven years is 0.711. And we just copy our calculation down again. So meaning we get the present value of, just make sure you're doing the cash flows up here. The present value of 89 is still minus 89 because it's at year zero. The seven of annuity is now going to be multiplied by 5.786. Lower discount rate, higher present value. And then finally, the 100 euro at the end is going to be multiplied by 0.711. So when you get the present value of all those cash streams, that will give you an NPV of 22.6. So we now have our pairing. We have rate 1, which I call R1, is 5%. R1 is always the lower one. NPV1, which is minus 3.62 or 22.6 or 2, should I say. So that's our first pairing we need. And your second pairing, R2, and NPV2 is 10% and minus 3.624. And once you have those, then you're going to use your IRR formula, which is a process called interpolation. So think about it now for your rules of thumb. I know my IRR is somewhere between 5 and 10, because that's where the, I want to find where the NPV is equal to 0. And think of your rule of thumb, it must be closer to 10%, because the minus 3 is closer to 0 than the 22.6. So always use your rules of thumb, because if you make a mistake and you get an IRR of 2% or 12%, you know you're wrong. Has to be between 5 and 10, has to be closer to the 10%. So the IRR formula then looks something like this. And again, you'll have this access because you have open book exam. This is your IRR formula. Rate 1 plus NPV1 times the two differences over NPV1 minus NPV2. So watch there. When you have a minus, minus, it becomes a plus. So we go back here. The IRR will be equal to 0 0.05, which is rate 1, plus, now just be careful with your brackets, that will be NPV1, which is 22.602, times the difference in rates, which is 10% minus 5%, divided by, now I know it's different, it's difficult to read there with the Excel, but you'll have an idea how the formula is laid out. So you have 22.602 times the difference in rates on the top, and on the bottom it's 22.602, and just be careful now, if you look back, it's a minus NPV2, but NPV2 is already a minus, and a minus minus becomes a plus. And that should be your formula. So it's going to be 5% plus that fraction, which ends up being 9.3%. So somewhere around 9.3, 9.4%. So that is our after-tax cost of debt. So remember, we've already taken away the tax implications in the cash flows. So our IRR is 9.31 or 9.3. And therefore, what you're also going to get then is the market value the market value, you're told the book value, is 20 million. So you're going to divide by 100, multiply by 89. So it's 20 million divided by 100 times 89, which is 17.8 million. So that's your two figures for your redeemable debt. 9.31 or 9.3. And then you're putting down... 17, 8, not, not. So there'll always be a bit of an error in a bit of margin of what's acceptable for some of these because of an IRR. You mightn't have taken 10% and 5%, so you might get a slightly different answer. So that is fine based on how IRR works. Finally, then we're looking at the new loan that they bought, that they took on. It's 10 million, but it's actually just a normal loan. It's not traded. So when it's not traded, you use the book value. You don't have any market value. So for working for, if you come down, you use the book value, which of course is 10 million, and you get the cost of debt will be after tax is 6% times 1 minus t. So because it's debt, you have to adjust for the tax element. So therefore, the after tax cost of your pro bank loan will be 5.25%.
So that's a relatively, again, straightforward one to finish it off. So you slot that in, which is 0525, and you're going to have 10 million in there. So your first step is always individual cost of capital and market values for each. And now we're going to get what we call our weight. So the total capital in this business, if we open it up, is now 210,500,000. To get your weight, because it is the weighted average cost of capital, you put the proportion of each source in the overall business. We don't look at current liabilities, even though they're given in the question, because they are not a longer term source of finance. That's just in there to see if you understand that logic. So that means about 71, 72% of our business is financed by ordinary share capital. 32 over 210, about 15% of it is financed by preference shares. Redeemable is 17 over 210, so about 8% is financed by a redeemable bond. And finally then, 10 over 210 is about 4.7% is financed by your pro bank loan. And of course, the weightings have to top to 100%. That kind of gives you an idea of what your capital structure looks like in the business. Finally then, so finally to get your weight average cost of capital, you say 71% of our business is financed at 28%. So you're just weighting the, getting the weighted average using the weight against the cost. So that's just more complicated how it's done there. So we just bring these in. Then 15% of your business is financed at 5%. 8% of your business is financed at 9%. And 4.8% of your business is financed at 5.25. So what you do is you get the weight times the cost. And all you do is add them up. And that becomes your weighted average cost of capital. So the overall cost of capital for this firm is somewhere around 22.38. So if you get in and around there, that would be the acceptable answer. And that should make sense because you're saying most of your business here is financed by equity and the equity is 28%. So that's bringing up the weighted average cost of capital. So the more you can lower that down, the lower your cost of capital overall will be. So that was a good revision of cap one finance, weighted average cost of capital. So now we're going to look at the second part of the mock interim assessment, which is looking at the labor variance report. So told one of Luke's focuses for the variant support is looking, or his focus for 2019, should I say, is looking at the standard costing and the variances in budgeting. And we're told to you, here's a labor variance report for the sandwich contract, and it looks to be 2,200 favorable. But he's saying here, these variances do not seem right to me, yet they've been linked to labor manager's bonuses. So he wants us to take a look. And the first thing we're asked to do is subdivide them into labor rate and labor efficiency variances. So we have the overall 2-2. Two, two. So if we come down to the bottom here, we start for a new question, part B. So overall labor variance. So your overall labor variance here is 2-2-0-0 two, two, not, not favorable. And what we're going to split it into then is, well, let's split it into labor rate and labor efficiency. And how I would do that is I do AH times AR. Actual hours times actual rate compared to actual hours times standard rate. And then standard hours times standard rate. So that's the kind of three column approach. Everyone has their own way of doing it. But I like to compare contrast then because this will give me my rate variance. And this will give me my efficiency variance. So the actual hours worked, we're told here, actual labor rate was 250 above the standard rate due to a shortage in skilled workers. Actual hours worked were 560. So we're told here the actual hours are 560 and the actual rate, we're told, is 250 above the standard rate. And we're told the standard rate was 15, so the actual must have been 1750. And again, we can check if that's right because we're told the actual cost was 9.8, so 560 times 17.5 is your 9.8. So it often can be given information in a kind of a roundabout way to see can you use it in the question. So here, 
it's 560 times 15. So 560 times 15 is 84. So you're seeing she paid two euro 50 extra for 560 hours. So that's going to be adverse. And the reason it's adverse is because you paid more than expected. You paid two euro 50 more than expected. So 14 adverse is your labor rate. Your standard hours, you're not told directly in the question what the standard hours are. Total, but you're told per batch are 50. So it's going to be 50 times 16 batches. That's your standard hours. And that is times 15 euro per hour. So 50 times 16 will be, if just do the calc. So 50 times 16 is 800. So it's 800 times 50. So you're saying you expected to use 800 based on a 50 hour per batch limit. 50 times 16. That would have been 800 times 15 is 12,000. So there's 3,600 there. You worked a lot less hours than expected. So that's favorable. And when you sum up the rate and the efficiency variances, you'll find that the overall variance is 2,200 favorable. So that was your first part to part B was to split it between rate and efficiency. So we can see here the big driver of this labor, overall labor variance is the efficiency. And that's what Luke is getting at in part two. He's saying recalculate the rate and efficiency variances based on a labor standard which takes account of the learning curve effect. So what we're actually told here is that 50 hours per batch where the 800 is coming from, that's based on the first batch. However, in past experiences, each of the new sandwich production, 90% learning curve will come into effect. So what they're saying is, well, if you produce 16 batches, the average time it takes to batch will fall and your 90% learning curve. So you can do it either way. You can do it using the doubling effect or you can use it the formula. And I'll show you both ways. So the batches here, you'll either go 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. So the reason you can do this here is because it's an even double. So you can't do this for an awkward number if it was 3 or 17 batches. But we can for this one. The average time per batch, that is what the learning curve applies to. Not the total time, the average time. So the average time per batch here for 1 is 50. 50 hours. You're told that in the question. However, when you double how well, the learning curve works, so when you double to two, it's going to be 90% of the previous. So the average time for two there is 45. And your total time here will be 50 times one, and it'll be 45 times two. So the total time to make two batches will be 90. If we double again, it'll go down by 90% again. The average time will go down, not the total time. So that means on average, it'll take four batches, will take 40.5 hours. So a total of 162 hours. And same logic again, if we double again, you multiply by 0.9. And if you double the A to 16, it goes down by 0.9 as well. So it's the average time, not the total time, that the learning curve is applied to. And of course, what we're interested in is in the total time. Total time for eight batches will be eight times 36.45, which would be 291. And the total time for 16 batches would be 52488. And that is the figure that's going to be our new standard. So not the 800, because that is ignoring the learning curve effect. So we're essentially making a standard that's too easy and not realistic. So of course it's going to be favorable. So because it's a nice even doubling figure of the number of batches, you can use the doubling effect. Alternatively, you can use this formula where the average time per batch is A, which is the time for the first batch, which is 100. X is the output in batches, which we're looking for as 16. And B is the log of the learning rate. So in this case, it's log 0.9 over log 2. 
So that's a formula approach. So if you get an, a batch figure or a unit figure that don't doesn't easily double two, four, six, or two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, you have to be able to use the formula. So just to prove it using the formula. Our A here is fifty, our X is sixteen, and our B equals the log of zero point nine divided by the log of two. Now I just don't know how to do don't even know if I have to uh, log in Excel. So I'll just do it in the calculator log point nine divided by log two is minus point one five two zero. So your formula approach then is A times put in brackets now the X sixteen to the power of minus point one five two. So that will hopefully get you what's the average time for 16 batches. The average time per batch is the same as above, 32,805. And the total time is times 16, is your 524.88. So the formula approach will give you the exact same answer. But the formula approach is more useful when you don't get a nice even number of batches. And it doesn't fall as easily as that. So essentially what we're saying there is the updated standard, which Luke is looking to use based on the learning curve effect, SH should be 524.88. So what he wants to do is we'll redo this analysis. What should the labor variance look like when you use the updated standard that accounts for the learning curve? So let's have a look here. Let's just delete these. So our actual hours actual rate actually doesn't change. It's still 9.8, as is the actual hours times the standard rate. So the first thing to note was neither of those changed. So that means our overall variance here for rate doesn't change. So the rate variance stays the same because you're not changing anything with the amount you paid. What you are changing is the standard hours. Standard hours now are 524, or you can say here, just to round if you wish, 525, 524.88 times 15. That's a fair, re more realistic standard to use than above 800 hours, because that didn't take account of the learning curve effect. So that says the cost standard, somewhere around 78. So you're above that, so it's actually turning adverse. So it's 526 or 527 adverse, and that is your efficiency. So you'll see that is how the learning curve could be brought into a broader um, variances question. And what you're asked then for a couple of marks is discuss the implications. Well, what we're saying here is that the overall learning curve, by taking that into account, your variance goes from 2 to positive to 196 or 1926 adverse. So it's a significant impact on the overall variances. And the reason that is you're using a falsely inflated labor hours standard. You are using a standard that is not realistic. You know it's not going to be 50 per batch as you increase the batches. So then it's making it too easy. And therefore, because it's linked, and this is what you need to hit, because it's linked to the bonus payments, Therefore, it's making it too easy to hit the bonuses. So what you need to do is make it more realistic by incorporating the learning curve. And you can have a read down through that in your in the solution just to see the key points that were met, linking it to the question as much as possible. So the last requirement in this paper was advise Luke on the limitations of the current approach to budgeting and Sanborn discussed three alternatives that could be useful. So again, the key thing at CAP2 level is we're looking for application. So you've covered budgeting approaches to budgeting in management accounting. But in particular, you're looking at what is Luke unhappy with. He says, currently the budgets are set each year for next, each November for next year by adjusting the previous year based on any planned activities or expansions. And they're not revised once they're initially updated. And he feels it needs to change. And he wonders if there are any better approaches because there's a lot of inefficiencies and surplus costs in the cost bit at the moment. So again, you'll notice there we don't mention the types of things we've covered 
uh, during your SFMA classes. What essentially we're looking for students to pick up on there is, you have to know that this is an incremental approach to budgeting. There are incremental budgeting each year, just adjusting a small bit year on year. And what that leads to is it leads to a lot of surplus, a lot of inefficiencies in your cost base because they're just, they're being repeated year on year. So you're trying to look at the limitations there. It's a one a year event. So therefore it probably becomes outdated very quickly and it's never updated. And also because you're rolling forward last year's without really any analysis, you're going to bring forward all the inefficiencies and cost overruns as well. So what we want students to pick up is identify it's incremental, identify the limitations, and then suggest some of the ones you'll see them in the solution. Zero based budgeting to do a one full sweep through to remove any cost inefficiencies. You might look at rolling budgets to avoid the situation where you don't update it only once a year and it becomes stale. Or you might suggest something like activity based budgeting to have a more activity focused and a more accurate focus on estimating what the cost will be next year. So 30 marks is a substantial amount for the paper, but you need to make sure it's applied as possible. We're not looking for regurgitating out your notes here because we're giving you enough information in the question to relate it back. So use the information that's given. So that was a good sample paper on the SFMA interim assessment.